Mr. Uh, Ms. Scanlon. Thank you, Chairman. And thank you, Director Ray, for being here today. Um, I'd you, like Mike. to focus my questions on foreign influence in our elections over the last several cycles and how that's contributed to the rise of extremist violence, which you highlighted in your opening remarks. I'm particularly interested in how Russia's escalating disinformation campaigns attacking the integrity of our American elections and our government contributed to the January 6th attack on this building, those who serve here, the brave officers who protected, and the very foundations of our government. And I'm interested in the role that Russian disinformation and the use of American proxies in spreading that disinformation is playing in continuing efforts to contest Mr. Trump's loss of the 2020 election and efforts by state legislatures to enact laws inspired by conspiracy theories and lies about election fraud. Now, Russian disinformation is a particular concern for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, which I represent because our election system and even our electoral college votes have been attacked repeatedly by Russian agents and their domestic proxies spreading propaganda and outright lies. The fact and the extent of those attacks has been detailed by multiple judicial, law enforcement, intelligence, and bipartisan congressional investigations, including the special counsel's report in 2019, the bipartisan Senate intelligence report last August, the indictment of more than a dozen go Russian government agents, and the National Intelligence Council's report on foreign threats to the 2020 elections in March of this year. Since this propaganda appears to have motivated people to participate in the Stop the Steal rally and the attack on the Capitol, and continues to motivate efforts in our state legislature to make it harder to vote, I'd like to direct your testimony to the longstanding and apparently continuing Russian efforts to undermine American confidence in our elections. And to start, I'd like to get one thing off the table, the difference between election interference and election influence. As I understand it, and referring to your prior testimony and the National Intelligence Council's report, election interference is defined as efforts to manipulate the mechanical aspects of voting, such as voter registration and election results. Is that right? Uh, that, that sounds right. I don't have the report in front of me, but I agree with you that it is important to make the distinction between interference and influence. Thank you. Well, I, I can give you a copy of the report if you'd like. Um, I'm not going to get that far into it. But um, specifically, the March report said there was, quote, no evidence, end quote, uh, not through intelligence collection on the foreign actors themselves, nor through physical security and cybersecurity monitoring of voting systems across the country, not through post-election audits, and not through any other means that a foreign government or other actors had compromised election infrastructure to manipulate election results. Do you stand by that conclusion? We contributed, obviously, to the National Intelligence Estimate and stand by that estimate. Thank you. So my concern is not fictitious election interference, which we know didn't happen, but actual election influence, which is propaganda designed to impact public opinion, and notably the long-standing Russian efforts to undermine public confidence in election processes and results by claiming that voting systems have been compromised. You said in your testimony before Homeland Security in 2020 that what concerns you the most is the steady drumbeat of misinformation um, Americans can and should have confidence in our election system and certainly our democracy, but you worried that people will have a feeling of futility because of all the noise and confusion that's generated. Should we still be concerned about a drumbeat of Russian misinformation, propaganda, that our elections are vulnerable to widespread fraud or manipulation? I think the, the, the drumbeat of misinformation from our adversaries, not just the Russians, but now also the Iranians, uh, for example, is something that we uh, uh, absolutely should be concerned about. I think the country has made significant strides, not just in, in protecting our election infrastructure from interference, back to your distinction there a minute ago, but also in highlighting the uh, prevalence of misinformation. So I do think, as a general matter, the country is getting wiser to misinformation, uh, and social media companies have started to play more responsible role than they used to uh, in helping to counter that. But it, uh, just as we're upping our game, our adversaries are upping our game too. 
Thank you. Um, one thing that's come uh, become more clear over the course of your testimony in the March report is that there was a shift in Russian tactics in 2020, and they, be they began to deploy their propaganda using domestic social media, um, and I, I believe the quote is U.S. officials and prominent U.S. individuals, some of whom were close to former President Trump. Um, certainly, Mr. Trump and many of his supporters have promoted conspiracy theories that claim without evidence that we cannot trust our election results. Uh, can you comment on whether since the 2020 election, Russia continues to promote propaganda and lies about the integrity of our elections and whether they're continuing to use U.S. proxies? The gentlelady's time has expired. The witness may uh, answer the question. Um, it I would just say that Russian efforts at disinformation in this country continue. It's a 365-day uh, a year phenomenon. Um, beyond that, that's really probably all I could say right now. Thank you. I would seek unanimous consent to place in the record the March uh, 2021 report from the National Intelligence Council on Foreign Threats to the 2020 U.S. foreign elections. Thank you. I yield back. That objection. The gentlelady yields back. Christopher Ray was flat out lying right there. And the, and the fact is, uh, he is an incompetent director. He was not qualified for this job. I think I'm you know, a huge Trump supporter, but I think it was one of the biggest mistakes uh, of the Trump presidency was putting Christopher Ray in there. And uh, I think he showed it, especially in this, his opening remarks that he made today, how biased he actually is. Because everything that he said, especially about extremist violence, was completely sided to the left. Everything that had to do with any type of group that calls themselves patriots or anything that happened on January 6th was noted and, and displayed by his language as something that is far extreme with very little, if any, people that were there that, to be peaceful. And he made it sound as though the left is mostly peaceful with just a few things. Everything that comes out of this guy's mouth is pushed to the left, but it's subtle. So if you've been you know, a prosecutor or a, a U.S. attorney, or if you've been in the FBI and you listen to his language, you can literally see this. And I, I, I think some of these congressmen and congresswomen actually saw this today, and I think they went after him, but he's not going to bend as far as that goes. I will tell you that I have spoken directly to FBI agents that are investigating January 6th, you know, um, issues, and ranging from individuals that uh, were in the Capitol to individuals who were not in the Capitol. One, one thing that stands out, the, the, the most recent conversation I had with an FBI, FBI agent here in Salt Lake indicated he said he's never seen anything like this. They are given a mandate. They are to go out. They have been given the questions they're supposed to be asking. They have been given the way they're supposed to proceed on this case. They don't have individualized authority. It is all coming from Washington, D.C. I've spoken to prosecutors that are prosecuting these cases. And this is not individualized justice. They are lumping everybody into the same category and they are treating them uh, like, un unlike I've ever seen in a case. Uh, the Department of Justice is supposed to address every single case, unless it's a conspiracy case, according to the criminal conduct of that individual. They're not doing that. None of the prosecutors mm. have authority. It's all coming straight from Washington, D.C. There is so much energy put towards these people, and there's not the same energy put towards Antifa. Why didn't he explain that? Why couldn't he explain that? Well, I don't think he could explain it because, again, he was making this into uh, more of a political uh, stand. And, you know, he, he said there were three categories of people on January 6th. He failed to completely mention the people who were literally invited into uh, the Capitol building by the, the Capitol Police. And the majority of the people that were there did nothing. It, he made it sound as though if you came on the Capitol grounds, you were an extremist. And that is just not the case. There were some violent people there. There were some people that went into the Capitol that did some very nefarious things. But his category, uh, the way he categorized these people was absolutely wrong. And the way that the FBI has systematically as uh, Brett just uh, pointed out there, been told how to investigate January 6th, they've systematically been kept from truly investigating or going after the leftists. And that is so clear because of the way that there's just nothing going down about these individuals on the left. And I'll, I'll just say one other thing. In all my time in the FBI, the only white supremacist case that I ever saw, and I was in New York the entire time, was prison-related. There was no white supremacy, uh, massive 
uh, agenda going on in the United States, and it's not happening now. And it's another example of how they use these things and push them out in the media. When you think about what Antifa did last summer, the number of federal properties that they destroyed um, or defaced, and the money that they caused to small businesses, the, the, the police officers who they injured, the Secret Service members, they really haven't been held accountable to the same type of behavior that they did all last summer. Why not? They have not been. I mean, you think about what domestic terrorism is. When you burn down a police station and you take over city blocks, that's domestic terrorism. And they have not been held accountable. Uh, I'm ashamed to, to say that, you know, my, my former office, you know, the Department of Justice, I, I wish I could see courage. I wish I, I could see U.S. attorneys standing up. You know, it's interesting. I, I represent an individual who... Um, went into the Capitol, um, was told she could go in, and was actually pointed by a security guard to the direction she should go. And she's being prosecuted. She's being charged with uh, misdemeanors. She, she has no criminal history. She thought the only other Capitol she's ever been in is a state Capitol that's open 24-7. She thought you could walk in. She, so there's a, there's a wide disparity a, a, between, you know, who Chris Ray is identifying and they want to prosecute every single person that was there to send a message. And that's what this is. It's message prosecuting. And, and, and that's mm -hmm. never a, a, an appropriate decision by a prosecutor.